and we would like for you to check out what it is and get involved because we want everybody to be involved in this movement. All right, so with that, let me launch into my talk. I want to ask a question. What is history good for? Is history good for anything? So if without uh, a people without a glorious future has no use for the past. So you might have heard the inverse of this, right? Uh, people without a past don't have a future. Uh, I'm inverting that statement. I'm, I'm saying those who do not have a glorious future really have no use for their history. What is the point of studying history if you're not looking forward to a bright and glorious future? And unfortunately today, a lot of people are stuck in this um, pessimistic mindset because there are lots of bad things happening around the world. You know, you hear about wars and rumors of wars and uh, um, lots of government repressions and yeah, lots of government repressions and uh, um, lots of negative news, bad news. So that's bad history. So why would you then look forward to a bright and glorious future? And I'm calling, I'm making the call that you should switch that mindset. You should develop a positive attitude for the future. You should develop an optimistic eschatology. So your eschatology is very, very important for studying the past. Because what is eschatology? Eschatology is a study of end times, right? Um, that's just a fancy word for study of end times. Everybody has an eschatology. So today there are different types of eschatologies in, in amongst the churches, amongst the Christians. There's, there are, most of them are very pessimistic and they are very defeatist. So what, what that has done is that your pessimistic eschatology has made the ecclesia church. By, by ecclesia, I mean the, there are two meanings for the church. There's a building church and then there's the people inside. And each person is a church as well, right? Each person is a temple of God. And then collectively, we are called the body of God, body of Christ, the ecclesia, all that one. So I'm not talking about the buildings, I'm talking about the people. The people have become weak and retreatist. They retreat behind the church walls and they have become defeatist because they are seeing all the bad things happening. And also they become anti-intellectual because they don't want to do research and study and go for higher studies and so on. Uh, so it is really good that Nesemini College is pushing those boundaries into, into intellectualism and into uh, higher studies. And so we need to repeat that spirit of anti-intellectualism. And also it has made people very hedonistic. Hedonistic as in they have given up the, the, uh, the drive to do hard work for the kingdom of God and instead they, they want to resort to pleasure um, and they feel that there's no point of working hard when we can just uh, eat, drink, and marry it. Just be satisfied with what we have. And be satisfied with the power structure that we have. So, the types of eschatology that are prevalent today is dispensationalism, premillennialism, and amillennialism, which are very pessimistic, and this is defeated the church. This is happening very disastrous to the church. If you are uh, holding on to these eschatologies, you're part of the problem. You need to let go and start to be um, an optimistic eschatology. And uh, what are the types? If there's post-millennialism or what Dr. Michelle Mandelay is calling parallel millennialism, we are inviting you to, uh, to study a positive optimistic eschatology. And so you can see all throughout the Bible, it talks about Jesus, the Son of Man, in uh, Daniel, it says that the Son of Man will be given dominion of over all people and nations and languages. They shall all serve him, right? And then, uh, in Revelation, in the last book, we can see how that has come to pass. All kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ Jesus. And so if you believe that, then, then you should be studying this. Right? If you don't believe that, there's no point in studying history. If you think that we're just 
leaving this world soon in a rapture, in a secret magical rapture, then don't waste your time studying history. Um, if you want to study history, go develop a positive eschatology. Now, historiography, the way history is uh, studied, that, that comes um, from principles derived from the Bible. In the Bible, you will see there are no myths or hearsay, right? There's no opinion of people. It's written as um, in a very neutral, objective perspective. It's God's idea. So there's good and bad. All people have bad to them, and it, they, uh, the bad things about David or Abraham is, is displayed uh, really in the Bible. They're not shown as myths or heroes with no bad sides to them because all human beings have, uh, are fallen. So it's written from God's perspective, not from a human perspective. And another thing about the Bible that is very unique is that common people are included in the history. So this is very different from the Greek history or any other history, even from ancient India or China or Africa and so on. Common people were not included in their history, right? So you have to be a king or a hero or some kind of a daddy god to be included uh, in, in the writings, in the literature. So in the Bible you'll see common people and you'll also see that big die starting in am I on the screen? Okay. Well, thank you for allowing me the, uh, the second coming. Um, and it's good to be back again for a second time. So I'll just uh, continue from where I left off last time. Um, I was talking about the methods of history, of studying history. Is uh, Those methods are derived from the Bible. Uh, one is that there are no myths or hearsay, there's no opinions. Um, common people are included, unlike in the past, um, in the Greek history or um, other literatures from India or even uh, China, etc. Common people were not included. There were, you had to be a king or somebody powerful in order for your story to be written down. If you were a common person, nobody cared. But in the Bible, you'll see common people were talked about, the, the common people were described and and also people who were victimized, they were named and honored and they were uh, re required to be given justice, right? So justice is a very important concept that, that is all throughout the Bible and God demands justice from us. And so that is a concept that you will see all throughout the Bible. Another thing is that places and times are referenced and noted. So it's not just uh, made up myths uh, or places. You know, they're, these are all real places, real times. And there's real references. And the point of view is neutral and objective. So it's God's eye view. And it's not like a small God or some king's view or whatever. It's God's view, right? It's a very objective, outside, external perspective. That of the of the duration of the Bible, and in uh, the history, geography, uh, etc., are biblical concepts. These are um, found in the Bible and derived from the Bible. History is progressing in a positive direction, but history is progressing towards a better a better time, towards an apotheosis. Right? There is a um, a, 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 a grand future awaiting us. That's our view of history. So history is not um, history is progressive. And the Bible is written in a manner read to be um, to be read as true. This is not a storybook, right? You don't read it like a storybook, but you read the Bible as a history book because history, the concept of history, is from the Bible. That's why we read the history books. It looks just like the Bible, right? Uh, the, the methodology is very similar. And it also references to our, uh, the, the, the doctrine of sola scriptura, right? 
right? The infallible, narrow word of God. And also the epistemology, the epistemology of doing history is built on the foundation of truth, right? So if you don't, um, so Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, you have a right to know the truth, right? You, as a human being, have a right to know the truth. So people shouldn't uh, cover up the truth from you. The truth should not be hidden. If it is hidden, you are called to seek it, to search and find out the truth. So these are these are very different perspectives than uh, many other cultures where truth is not given to everybody. You don't have the right. You are on a need to know basis, right? Um, you don't, you're not important enough to know. No, there's no such thing in the Bible. You, everybody is important. Why? Well, um, God is the Lord of history and the future. And God wants us to be a witness of history and to testify history. So he wants us to observe history and then to testify. You can see that all throughout. You can see in Isaiah 44, it's about what God says, I am the first and the last, right? I am the first and I am the last. There is no other God beside me. Then you can see how uh, he continues. And who can proclaim, right? You see that word, proclaim. And let him declare it. Declare what has been done. Declare history. Since I appointed the ancient people. So the people in the past were appointed by God. So God directed history. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. So God is the one who is in charge of what's coming, the future. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. Have I not told you from that time? You declared it. You are my witness. So God wants you to witness history. And, and of course, the Bible is history. So we're not just talking about the gospel as history, but also what happened around the world because you know, the old Max's his, history is, is story, right? So and in Revelation, you can see the same thing repeated again. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So that's the, the history and the present and the future. God is in control. And you can see how the language there, as I, Jesus, has sent my angel to testify to you and um, about these things for the churches. For the churches, you are the church. Every one of us is the church, the Ecclesia. I am the root and the descendant of David. See, these are historical languages, right? You can see how God uses this language and it's derived from this. And so, why did God create us? God created us in God's image to create history and to have dominion on the earth. So, why do you do? You're creating history today. History is being written. And so whatever we do, or whatever our ancestors did, that's all history. So God created man in his own image. God created each one of us human beings, regardless of what your religion, or your faith, or your position in life, male or female, child or old, you're all made in God's image. This is very different from many other cultures and religions where there are different castes and races and so on. Those are the stuff are a result of the fall. And you, we know now that through Christ Jesus, all of our all people have been united on the cross. And that was demonstrated on the day of Pentecost, right? When, when multiple languages were spoken in Jerusalem. That is a sign of the unity of people. And so when uh, I want to give on to, to you, I want to give to you this idea that. Genesis 128 mandates, right? The be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. That mandate is fulfilled through the Great Commission. They are the same. They are the same. Genesis 128 equals Matthew 28, 18, and 19. You can see the same structure here. God of the universe, and here Jesus is saying, all authority has been given to me. So this is a God with all power in heaven and earth. That is the God of the universe. He is talking down to his disciples. Just like here in the Garden of Eden, God, or, or at the creation time, when God talks down to a human being, 
here, God is standing next to the human beings and talking to them and saying, make disciples of all nations and baptize the nations. See, we are this verse often misread as a collective, or as an individual verse. As in, go and make disciples in the nation. Right? So go to India uh, and make a disciple there. Right? Like Mr. John or Miss, Miss Mary. You know, no. It says, make a disciple of India. Make a disciple of India as well as Sri Lanka and Pakistan and U.S. and Dubai and the UAE and every, every one of them should be made disciples. The nations should become disciples, not individuals. And you're supposed to baptize the nation. How can you baptize a country? So this is a meta command. This meta command needs to be thought through and reinterpreted in this light of a positive eschatology. And we are told, told to teach all nations, all things that are commanded. So it's reading nothing out, all things. All right, so a very positive, Christians need a positive, optimistic, mystic eschatology. And especially the young people in the crowd, I'm calling to you to, develop, to give up your pessimism, your fear, and ask God to give you courage and to develop an optimistic eschatology. Because without a good eschatology, then you, you, you don't have a future. You're not going to build a strong future. So you need to develop a good eschatology. Because you can see how the positive eschatology tells the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Right? What happens when we go out and do the Great Commission? The whole world is going to know about God. And the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. That this is from Isaiah and not Habakkuk. And then, let me ask you this. Okay, everybody is familiar with this verse. And this is the incident where Simon Peter, uh, where Jesus asks the disciples about what, what everybody thinks Jesus is. Right? And Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the rock. That is, the rock is Christ. So, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, the rock of Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. Right? Everybody knows this first. I want to ask you a question. What is the church doing at the gates of hell? Why is the church at the gates of hell? Who is attacking who? Who is attacking who here? in this verse. Is the gates of hell attacking the church? Or is the church attacking the gates of hell? Gates are defensive. Gates are for defense, not for offense. Who is on the offense here? The church is on the offense. Why is the, the church at the gates of hell? Because the church is attacking hell. The church is attacking hell. Hell is not attacking the church. The church is attacking hell. This is the mindset of a positive eschatology. So yes, we have troubles because you are standing in hell. But you are trying to rescue people. When you're trying to render justice to people who don't have justice, that is hell. Hell is where there is no, where God is not there, and and God is watching. God, God is there, but that is Hades, where death and injustice prevails. And the church is supposed to be there to attack the hell and with retrieve people out of hell. And so Jesus taught us not an executive leadership. Jesus taught us a servant leadership, as you know from Matthew 20, 25. Um, don't don't any, 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 the okay because of lack of time. I'm going to uh, keep going. So as we start teaching the world about the gospel and the Bible, the knowledge of God is going to spread around the world, and then we will have true peace. And prosperity because, as it says in Matthew 2, 
For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters covers the sea. And what happens when everybody knows God? Well, they will stop fighting. They will beat their swords into plowshares. Imagine turning guns and missiles into agricultural equipment. This is prophecy that is supposed to happen. It is going to happen. And it will only happen when we preach the gospel. That is why we are preaching. It is not an, uh, just for the individuals. We are preaching to change nations, to make them peaceful and prosperous. This, well, that is the only way to prosperity, is to give them the gospel and the knowledge of the Lord, the glory of God, so that they beat their weapons into plowshares. And in Jeremiah 31, it says, God says, I will put my law within them and I will write the law of God on their hearts, and they shall all know me. Everyone will know from the least of them to the greatest. Um, and then the church is the tree planted by the river in Revelation. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. And, and so that's what we are for. We are here to heal the nation. And creation is waiting for the children of God uh, to be revealed. Now, did you know that India got the name India from the Bible? And, and so, if, if you want to know more about this, I'll, I'll give you the link, and that is to go to Vishal Mandawadi's page. This is in, uh, on YouTube. So, Vishal Mandawadi has a number of videos, and you can see how uh, things like uh, um, the Bible taught human equality, the Bible brought modern education to India, um, the Bible created the steel frame of India, the Bible created Indian languages, Indian nationalism came from the Bible, Indian sense of geography and cartography came from the Bible, etc. Was Bharat in India because of the Bible, etc. So I would ask you to go um, on YouTube and watch the Shalom videos. But you can see, uh, here is the Latin, this is the Latin Vulgate Bible. And it says in the book of Esther, chapter 1, verse 1, and the word India, in Diego's Asweri, he read that it of India, Uski, Ethiopian. So then there, that word India is the Latin for what the, the Europeans called it, the, the Arabs and Europeans, what they called the Persians, what the Persians called it before. So when, when this was written down, um, they used the word India, but the Hebrew word was translated into the Latin, which is India. And that is how we got the name India. And this is why we are called Indians, because of, of this, because of the Bible. Um, now, this book, uh, this man is not a Christian. He is a secular historian, Tom Holland, and he's written many books. This is the same book with two different covers. Dominion. You notice the word, word dominion. He used that word deliberately because he's taking that word from Genesis 1 28. And he's saying how the Christian revolution remade the world or the making of the Western mind. Please check out this book. Uh, you, you can buy this book or you can watch this YouTube videos where he talks about this, uh, this book. Now, Michelle has a number of books here. How the Bible created modern India is going to be released in a month or two very soon and then these books uh, you might uh, have seen already and uh, Babu Burgis, Dr. Babu Burgis' book, Let There Be India, these are, um, everyone should have all these books on their libraries if you're a historian or a history student. Now this is another book called the J.P. Thesis. The J.P. Thesis was that science was born of Christianity uh, science was born of Christianity because the epistemology, the ontology, uh, and, and ethics, or the scientific method, came out of the Bible. And that's why, um, even though there was technology all over the world in India and China and Africa and, and the, the, the Americas, they did not develop modern science. Modern science requires the epistemology, the worldview of the Bible. And uh, Rodney Stark is a professor. He died just early this year. Um, he's written many books about um, the history of Christianity.
Christianity. Uh, I would advise you to go check that out. Now, finally, I want to uh, end with this call. So it's time that Christians, as well as all Indians, of course, study history um, on, on, um, and also to adopt technology for studying history. So we need to digitize records. So uh, the Seminary College will have lots of historical records, literature, artifacts, the building itself is historical. All of that needs to be digitized. I am extremely privileged to be at the National and the Indian in College of Montana. If I am not exaggerating, one of the best colleges in this district. And that took 80 years the objective of the seminar being organized by, again, one of the best departments in the whole of the Indian industry the Department of History and the Secretary I see the ladies from a lot of other colleges. Please don't get offended when I say NMCC is the best and the Department of History is the best. And when we organize a conference in your college, I will call your college best and your department best. That is that. So it all depends upon the way that you are thinking of conceptualizing the very idea of organizing such interactive seminars and conferences. Today, my address is about the past, the present, and the future. Just now you listened to an excellent enormous address in which he said, Dr. Billy Parker, history is optimistic eschatology. History is optimistic is the torch. History is the glorious apotheosis. Perhaps some of the words that you use like is the torch and apotheosis might be Latin and Greek to some of the scholars. Don't worry about it. I tried to think it. All that he meant was if history cannot lead you and I to a state of a glorious future, what is the earthly use of reviewing the past and reinterpreting the present? All that you talk in history is not about the dead past. It is not about the equally dead present, but about the glorious future that awaits us. That is why he said, unless you make it an optimistic eschatology of the very national discourse of the global discourse, an international conference of this kind is not going to serve any purpose at all. Because Mahatma Gandhi who said, I forever would remain an optimist. You remember the famous word of Mahatma Gandhi during the freedom struggle. Maybe all the peace which Mahatma Gandhi always encouraged, being the incurable Democrat that this country, the world has ever, ever seen. I keep all my windows and doors open. The presence of every culture that go into me, into my room, into my country, but I will not allow myself to be swept off my feet. So, so confident, so confident. So confident of what he stood for. And he was the one who said, I shall lead the freedom of men all by myself, all alone, walking across the length and breadth of India, even if all my followers desert and go away from me. Maybe Babi Jal love you, maybe Deva Nisubas from your post, maybe Vadabai Babi. Never, never, never. Because my destination is very clear. That's what we're obviously talking about, the glorious future. Today, as we stand here, possibly at another discourse, a national discourse, on the challenges and the prospects before us, it is this optimism that makes me free to proclaim to the world that I am a proud Indian. Come on me. Your principal is obviously talking about corruption. Possibly the keynote speaker is going to speak about communalism. 
in the context of the evolution of the very idea of secularism in India. But I do want to believe whatever the yields be, whatever the problems that you and I encounter be, whatever the darker shadows that we see around us, whatever the mist of the cloud of oppression, all in the name of undeclared emergency in India is going around. Never, 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 ever bother us to who say my freedom of spirit will always be so high in heaven. That gives me the confidence to proclaim to the world that I am an Indian. And to very briefly, just one word about the past, one about the present, and one about the future. 1947. August 15, India won independence. At 12 o'clock midnight, a wonderful speech, nothing but sheer poetry, and those lovers of the English language possibly would ever come across such a beautiful poetic exaltation as was delivered on the floors of the Indian Parliament, the lower house, by one of the greatest Indian English writers, Pandit Jawaharlal. As the clock strikes 12, when the whole world is asleep, India awakes to its independence. What a great address of optimism. True, we made a twist to destiny years ago. True, that there is famine, there is poverty, there is corruption, there is communalism, and all the ills that they can find in any country, perhaps in India. But then, we made a twist with destiny. We are optimistic. We are hopeful. We always anticipate the glorious future for India. No spirit on earth can cow us down. Indian spirit is a spirit that always holds high. And now they turn to Mahatma Gandhi. Maybe was very particular that Babu should be by his side when the Union Jack was brought out and the tri-colored Indian flag was unfurled. It was not hard to say. It was unfurled. And he said, if only Babu were by my side. Babu said, my business is not in Indian Parliament. My business is not on the red floor, why is the flag? And Babu was walking around, Navakali in Calcutta, trying to go down, bring about peace, reconciliation, amity, and understanding. Between the two communities, Hindus and Muslims. And Gandhi said, What is your vision of India? What is your dream of India? Very good to Only in a good size, Indeed. And Gandhi said, my wish, my wish, you know what my wish is? To wipe out every tear from every eye.